essays thirteen and fourteen of the romance of the commonplace by gillette burgess this librivox recording is in the public domain essay thirteen the tyranny of the lares no i have never been tainted with a mania for collecting it has never particularly interested me because i already happen to have two of a kind to possess a third i prefer things to be different rather than alike and the few things i really care for i like for themselves alone and not because they are one of a family set or series but there are so few things to be envious of even then after one's necessities are provided for there are not many things worth possessing and fewer still worth the struggle of collecting acquisition seems to rob most things of their intrinsic value of the extreme desirability they seem to possess and yet it does not follow that the practice of collecting is not worth while it is worth while for itself but not for the things collected it is like hunting the enjoyment to your true sportsman does not depend entirely upon the game that is bagged if the hunter went out solely for the purpose of obtaining food he would better go to the nearest poulterer we have a habit of associating the idea of pleasure with the possession of certain objects and we fancy such pleasure is permanent but in nine cases out of ten the enjoyment is effervescent and the thing must be gazed at touched and admired while the charm is new then only can one feel the sharp joy of possession and even though its value remain as an object of art we must after that enjoy it impersonally its delight must be shared with other spectators as far as the satisfaction of ownership is concerned the thing is dead for us and though we would not give it up our greed gilds it but cheaply after all of all things pictures are most commonly regarded as giving pleasure a painting is universally regarded as a desirable possession of more or less value according to personal appreciation in fact most men would say that a poor picture is better than none since one of its recognized functions is to fill a space on the wall and yet how few pictures are looked at once a day or once a week how many persons accept them only as decoration as spots on the wall and pass them by in their familiarity as unworthy of especial notice but the collection of a multitude of things is no great oppression if one is permanently installed they pad out the comforts of life they create atmosphere they fill up spaces in the house as small talk fills up spaces in conversation the first prospect of moving however brings this horde of stupid useless dead things to life and they appear in their proper guise to strike terror into the heart of the owner pictures that have never been regarded curiosities that are only curious books that no longer feed the brain and the thousand little knick-knacks that accumulate in one's domicile and multiply like parasites all the flotsam and jetsam of housekeeping must be individually attended to and rejected or preserved piecemeal but that exciting decision it is not till one has actually had the courage to destroy some once prized possession that one feels the first inspiring thrill of emancipation before the thing owned you it had to be protected in its useless life kept intact with care and attention you were pledged to forestall dust rust and pillage if you yourself selected it it stood as a tangible evidence of your culture an ornament endorsed as art the thing forbade growth of taste or judgment it became a changeless reproach if it were a gift it ruled you with a subtle tyranny compelling your hypocrisy enslaving you by chains of your very good nature but if you do not falter in one exquisite pang you are freed the thing is destroyed not given away not hidden or disguised but murdered outright it is your sublime duty to yourself that demands the sacrifice these horrid monsters once put out of your life and all necessity for their care annulled you have so much more space for the few things whose quality remains permanent you will guard the entrance to your domicile and jealously examine the qualifications of every article admitted you will ask is it absolutely necessary 
if so then let it be as beautiful as possible putting into its perfection of design the expense and care formerly bestowed on a dozen trifles you will use gold instead of silver linen instead of cotton ivory in the place of celluloid in short whatever you use intimately and continually whatever has a definite plausible excuse for existence should be so beautiful that there is no need for objects which are merely ornamental it was so before machinery made everything possible common and cheap it has been so with every primitive civilization to the unspoiled peasant to all of sane and simple mind ornaments have in themselves no reason for being pictures are unnecessary because the true craftsman so elaborates and develops the constructive lines of his architecture that the decoration is organic and inherent the many household utensils vessels and implements of daily use were so appropriately formed so graceful and elegant in their simplicity so cunning of line so quaint of form and pleasant of colour that they were objects of art and there was no need for the extraneous display of meaningless adornment once you are possessed with this idea you will suddenly become aware of the tyranny of things and you will begin to dread becoming a slave to mere possessions you may still enjoy and admire the possessions of others but the ineffable bore of ownership will keep you content the responsibility of proprietorship will strike you with terror gifts will appall you the opportunity of ridding yourself of one more unnecessary thing will be welcomed as another stroke for freedom your friends houses will become your museums and they the altruistic custodians allowing you the unalloyed sweets of appreciation with none of the bitter responsibilities of possession for you if you are of my kind and would be free to fly light flitting gypsy fashion wherever and whenever the whim calls must not be anchored to an establishment we must know and love our few possessions as a father knows his children we must be able to pack them all in one box and follow them footloose this is the new order of friars minor modern paulists who have renounced the possession of things and by that vow of disinheritance parting with the paltry delights of monopoly have been given the roving privilege of the whole world essay fourteen costume and custom a friend of mine has reduced his habit of dress to a system dressing has long been known to be a fine art but this enthusiast's endeavour has been to make it a science as well to give his theories practical application to the routine of daily life to do this he has given his coats and jackets all anglo-saxon names his frock is called albert for instance his morning coat cedric a grey tweed jacket arthur and so on his waistcoats masquerade under more poetic pseudonyms a white piquet is known as reginald a spotted cashmere as montmorency and i have seen this eccentric in a wonderful plaid vest hight ruhak his trousers and pantaloons are distinguished by family names i need only mention such remarkable aliases as braghampton a striped cheviot garment and a pair of tennis flannels denominated smithers his terminology includes also appellations by which he describes his neckwear simple prefixes such as de or von or mac or fitz modifying the name of the waistcoat and titles for his hats varying from a simple sir for a brown bowler to prince for a silk topper of the season's block now my mythical friend is not such a fool as you might think by this description of his mania for he is moved to this fantastic procedure by a psychological theory the gentleman is a private if not a public benefactor the joy of his friends and delight of his whole acquaintance for never in the course of their experience has he ever appeared twice in exactly the same costume it may differ from some previous habilitation only by the tint of his gloves but the change is there with its subtle suggestion of newness 
indeed this sartorial dilettante prides himself not so much upon the fact that his raiment is never duplicated in combination as that the changes are so slight as not to be noticed without careful analysis his maxim is that clothes should not call attention to themselves either by their splendour or their variety but that the effect should be upon the emotions rather than upon the eye he holds that it should never be particularly noticed whether a man dresses much or dresses well but that the impression should be of an immortal freshness sustaining the confidence of his friends that his garb shall have a pleasing note of composition it is to accomplish this that he has adopted the mnemonic system by which to remember his changeling combinations he has but to say to his valet muggins this morning you may introduce earl edgar von courtenay blankensop and his man familiar with the nomenclature of the wardrobe will after his master has been bathed shaved and breakfast clothe the artist accordingly in panama hat sack coat cheerful fawn waistcoat a tender heliotrope scarf and pin-check trousers or perhaps looking over the calendar the man may announce that this fantastic earl has already appeared at the club in which case a manipulation of the tie or waistcoat changes von courtenay to o Shanstruther. the earl must not according to the rules appear twice in his full complement of costume his existence is but for a day but anstruther the merry corduroy vest may become a part of many personalities so much for my friend rigmarole who does if you like carry his principles to an extreme but surely we owe it to our friends that our clothes shall please it is as necessary as that we should have clean faces and proper nails but more than this we owe it to ourselves that we shall not be known by any hackneyed unvarying garb it need not be taken for granted that we shall wear brown or blue we should not become identified with a special shape of collar servants must wear a prescribed livery priests must always appear clad in the cloth of their office and the soldier must be content with and proud of his uniform but free men are not forced to inflict a permanent visual impression upon their fellows he must follow the habit and style of the day be of his own class and period and yet besides if he can be himself always characteristic while always presenting a novel aspect it is as necessary for a man as for a woman and though the elements which he may combine are fewer they are capable of a certain kaleidoscopic effect our time is cursed more than any other has been perhaps with hard and fast rules for men's costume and for all clothing evening dress in which in the old days was granted the greatest freedom of choice is now subject to the most rigid prescription we must all appear like waiters at dinner but daylight allows tiny licenses perhaps our garments are always darkest just before the dawn and the new century may emancipate men's personal taste so far at least we may go a frock coat does not compel a tie of any particular colour and a morning coat does not invariably forbid a certain subdued animation in the way of waistcoats we may already choose between at least three styles of collar and yet be received at five o'clock and coloured shirts are making a hard fight to oust the white linen which has reigned for more than half a hundred years it takes no great wealth to take advantage of these minor opportunities nor need one be pronounced a fop if one uses one's chances well he is safest who wears only what the best tailor has advised every other of his customers but who cares for a tailor's model who cares i might add to be safe there is safety in numbers but whoever remembers or cares for the victims of such commonplace discretion we are men not mice why should our coats be all of the same fashionable hue and of the same length of tail but the times are changing and we may look forward with confident hope to the renaissance of colour already we may see the signs of the change that is approaching 
god forbid that men should become the dandies of the regency that we should ever ape the incredible or go without pockets but we may pray heartily for the wedding of art and reason let us pray we shall no more wear cylinders or cap our skulls with tight-fitting boxes meanwhile i fear we must buy another necktie for my only one is well worn out and celestine swears she can recognize that blue serge suit of mine clear across the park end of essay fourteen essays fifteen and sixteen of the romance of the commonplace by gillette burgess this librivox recording is in the public domain essay fifteen old friends and new old friends we say are best when some sudden disillusionment shakes our faith in a new comrade so indeed they are yet i count many newly made ties as stronger than those of my youth keep close and hold my hand i'm afraid for an old friend is coming celestine once whispered to me while our love was young how well i understood her panic she was swung by the conflicting emotions of loyalty and oppression her old friend had rights but her new friend had privileges with me a stranger she was frankly herself with him a familiar she must be what he expected of her how shall we arrange the order of precedence for the late and early comers into our hearts how shall we adjudicate their conflicting claims that is the problem to be answered by every one who lives widely and who would not have writ upon his gravestone he made more friends than he could keep were one content to pass from flower to flower it would be easy enough but i would gather a full fragrant and harmonious bouquet for my delight to one sensitively loyal each new friend must at first sight seem to come as a robber to steal a fragment of his heart from its rightful owner we say make many acquaintances but few friends we swear undying devotion and we promise to write every week but if we practice this reserve this fastidious partiality and this exclusive attention how shall we grow and increase in worth and how shall the brotherhood of man be brought about we may think that each friend has his own place and is unique satisfying some especial part of our nature each to be kept separate in his niche the saint to whom we turn for sympathy in those matters wherein we have vowed him our confidences we may satisfy our consciences by giving to each the same number of candles and by a religious celebration of each saint's day keeping the calendar of our devotions independent and exclusive but this method does not make for growth it is our duty to help knit society together to modify extremes to transmit and transform affection surely there is love enough for all and the more we give the more we shall have to give to our friends whether they be old or new friendship is however a matter of caste with just as many as share our point of view or can understand it who laugh at the things we laugh at who are tempted by our temptations and sin our sins can we have a divine fellowship through these to others outside of our ken through friend to friend's friend the tie passes that shall bind the whole world together at last our set of friends is a solar system a cluster of planets that revolve about us moves with the same trend through space and time each member of the fraternity has its own aphelion and perihelion occultation and transit whether they are visible or invisible we must be sure that each in due season will return to the same relative position and exert the same attraction answering the law of gravity that in true friendship keeps them in their orbits about us but the circles interlace and in that is the possibility of keeping the unity of our constellation of friends were the same comrades to accompany us unceasingly we could not develop there must be an intricate complication of actions and reactions and we must be affected by each in turn and in combination what is a parting from a friend but a departure in quest of new experience 
each fresh meeting therefore should be the sharing of the fruits that both have gathered that each may profit by the contribution if you tell me of a book you have read i am amused and profited by the knowledge you bring me shall i not be grateful to you for what you bring from an interesting person if every new friend contributes to our development and enriches us by his personality not only are we the better for it ourselves but more worth while to our friends it is not you as you are whom i love best but you as you shall be when in due time you have come to your perfect stature wherefore i shall not begrudge the loan of you to those who have set you on the way though we may hold one friend paramount over all others and admit him to every phase of intimacy there are minor confidences that are often most possible with an entire stranger were we to meet a man of the sixteenth century what could we not tell such an impersonal questioner what would we care for the little mortifications that come between even the best of friends we could confess faults and embarrassments without shame we could share every hope and doubt without fear for he would regard us without bias or prejudice he could scourge us with no whip of conventional morality and he would be able to judge any action of itself hampered by no code or creed we had a game once my sister and i in which we agreed to look at each other suddenly newly as if we had never met before frequently we were able to catch a novel phase of character and our subconscious self freed from the servitude of custom bounded in a new emotion could we in this way at times regard our friends how much we might learn we fall into the habit of seeing what we look for, and we compel old friends to live up to the preconception. Why not look at them, occasionally, as strangers to be studied and learned? There are two variable quantities in the equation of friendship, yourself and myself. Nor is our relation itself fixed. It is alive and changing from hour to hour. There is no such thing as an unalterable friendship, for both parties to the affair are moving at different speeds, first one and then the other ahead, giving a hand to be helped on and reaching back to assist. Might we not indeed reverse the previous experiment and regard any stranger as a blood relative assuming a fraternity of interest? We need only to be honest and kind. By these two processes we may keep old friends and make new ones, and our conscience shall acquit us of disloyalty when one enlarges one's establishment one does not decrease either the wages or the duties of the servants before employed the new members of the household have new functions more is given and more is received but it is not so much that one must give more as that one should give wisely and economically we must be generous in quality rather than in quantity for though there is love enough to go around for all there is not time enough for most of us we must clasp hands give the message and pass on trusting to meet again on the journey and come to the same inn at nightfall essay sixteen a defense of slang could shakespeare come to chicago and listen curiously to the man in the street he would find himself more at home than in london in the mouths of messenger boys and clerks he would find the english language used with all the freedom of unexpected metaphor and the plastic suggestive diction that was the privilege of the elizabethan dramatists he would say no doubt that he had found a nation of poets there was hardly any such thing as slang in his day for no graphic trope was too virile or too uncommon for acceptance if its meaning were patent his own heroes and heroines too for rosalind's talk was as forcible in figures of speech as any modern americans often spoke what corresponds to the slang of to-day the word indeed needs precise definition before we condemn all unconventional talk with opprobrium slang has been called poetry in the rough and it is not all coarse or vulgar there is a prosaic as well as a poetic license the man in the street calls a charming girl for instance a daisy surely this is not inelegant and such a reference will be understood a century hence without a footnote 
slang to prove adjuvant to our speech which is growing more and more rigid and conventional should be terse it should make for force and clarity without any sacrifice of beauty still manner should be fit matter the american dude is perhaps no more unpleasant a word than the emasculated fop it describes the english bounder is too useful an appellation to do without in london and were that meretricious creature of pretense and fancy waistcoat more common in the united states the term would be welcome to american slang with enthusiasm new york alas has already produced cads but no yankee school would ever tolerate a fag the mere substitution of a single synonymous term however is not characteristic of american slang your chicago messenger boy coins metaphorical phrases with the facility of a primitive savage a figure of speech once started and come into popular acceptance changes from day to day by paraphrase and so long as a trace of the original significance is apparent the personal variation is comprehensible not only to the masses but generally to those whose purism eschews the use of the common talk thus to give the glassy eye became the colloquial equivalent of receiving a cool reception the man on the street inventive and jocose does not stop at this at his caprice it becomes giving the frozen face or even the marble heart in the same way one may hear a garrulous person spoken of as talking to beat the band an obvious metaphor or later to beat the cars the only parallel to this in england is the rhyming slang of the costers and the thieves patter there a railway guard may be facetiously termed a christmas card and then abbreviated to card alone thence to permutations not easily traced but english slang is for the most part confined to the masses and is an incomprehensible jargon to all else save those who make an especial study of the subject one may sit behind a bus driver from the bank to fulham and understand hardly a sentence of his colloquies and jibes at the passing fraternity but though the language of the trolley conductor of chicago is as racy and spirited it needs less translation the american will it is true be enigmatic at times you must put two and two together you must reduce his trope to its lowest terms but common sense will simplify it it is not an empirical arbitrary wit depending upon a music-hall song for its origin i was riding on a broadway car one day when a semi-intoxicated individual got on and muttered unintelligibly put me off at brooklyn street please i turned to the conductor and asked what did he want the official smiled oh, you can search me he said in denial of any possession of apprehension slang in america then is expression on trial if it fits a hitherto unfurnished want it achieves a certain acceptance but it is a frothy compound and the bubbles break when the necessity of the hour is past so that much of it is evanescent some of the older inventions remain such as bunco and lynch and chestnut but whole phrases lose their snap like uncorked champagne though they give their stimulant at the proper timely moment like the eggs of the codfish one survives and matures while a million perish the observed of all observers ophelia's delicate slang observed was yesterday in new york the main guy a term whose appositeness would be easily understood in london where the fall of the gunpowder plot is still celebrated later in chicago according to george ade a modern authority it became the main squeeze and another permutation rendered the phrase useless it is this facility of change that makes most slang spoil in crossing the atlantic on the other side english slang is of so esoteric an origin and reference that no yankee can translate or adopt it it is drop forged and rigid an empiric use of words to express humour what englishman indeed could trace the derivation of balmy on the crumpet as meaning what the american would term dotty or bug house unless he was actually present at the music hall where it was first invented 
we have at least three native languages to learn the colloquial the literary prose and the separate vocabulary of poetry in america slang makes a fourth and it has come to be that we feel it as incongruous to use slang on the printed page as it is to use said he or she replied with a smile in conversation and except for a few poets such words as haply welkin or beauteous in prose yet stevenson himself the purist who avoids foreign words uses scotch which nearly approaches slang for there is little difference between words of an unwritten dialect and slang such as scrannel and widdershins while wilkie collins writes white wanyan kittle gar and collop in with english sentences as doubtless many questionable words of to-day will be honoured in the future slang the illegitimate sister of poetry makes with her a common cause against the utilitarian economy of prose both stand for lavish luxuriance in trope and involution for floriation and adornment of thought it is their boast to make two words grow where but one grew before both garb themselves in metaphor and the only complaint of the captious can be that whereas poetry follows the accepted style slang dresses her thought to suit herself in fantastic and bizarre caprices that her whims are unstable and too often in bad taste but this odium given to slang by superficial minds is undeserved in other days before the language was crystallized into the verbiage and idiom of the doctrinaire prose too was untrammelled a cursory glance at the elizabethan poets discloses a kinship with the rebellious fancies of our modern common colloquial talk for gargarism scarab quadling puckfest scroyle foist pumpion trindletail comrogue pig's bones and ding-dong we may now read chump scab chaw yap fake bloke pal bad actor and so on she's a delicate dab chick says ben jonson she had all the component parts of a peach says george ade it will be seen that slang has two characteristics humour and force brevity is not always the soul of wit for to-day we find amusement in the euphemisms that in the sixteenth century were taken in all seriousness the circumlocutions will drop speedily out of use but the more apt and adequate neologisms tend to improve literary style for every hundred times slang attributes a new meaning to an old word it creates once or twice a new word for an old meaning many hybrids will grow some flower and a few seed so it is with slang there is a gentleman's slang as thackeray said and there is the impossible kind but of the bulk of the american product the worst to be said of it usually is that it is homely and extravagant none the less is it a picturesque element that spices the language with enthusiasm it is antiseptic and prevents the decay of virility literary style is but an individual glorified slang it is not impossible for the artist it went to its extreme in the abandon of ben jonson webster and beaumont and fletcher but as your cockney would say it does take a bit of doin nowadays end of essay sixteen essays seventeen and eighteen of the romance of the commonplace by gillette burgess this librivox recording is in the public domain essay seventeen the charms of imperfection for a long time i have held a stubborn belief that i should admire and aim at perfection i admitted its impossibility of course i attributed my friend's failure to achieve it as a charming evidence of their humanity but it seemed to me to be a thing most properly to be desired and yet upon thinking it over i was often astonished by the discovery that most of my delights were caused by a divergence from this ideal a sweet disorder in the dress kindleth enclose a wantonness now is this because i am naturally perverse and enjoy the bizarre the unique and the grotesque is it because of my frailty that i take a dear delight in signs of our common humanity in the petty faults and foibles of the world 
or is it because i have misinterpreted this ideal of perfection and have thought it necessary or proper to worship a conventional criterion celestine and i have been puckering our brows for a week over the problem we have learned after a quarter of a century's experience with the turning lathe and fret saw to turn back for lasting joy to handmade work we delight in the minor irregularities of a carving for instance recognizing that behind that slip of the tool there was a man at work a man with a soul striving for expression the dreary methodical uniformity of machine-made decoration and furniture wearies our new enlightened taste mathematical accuracy and spirit seem to be mutually exclusive and we have been taught by the modern aesthetic almost to regard amateurishness as a sure proof of sincerity we cannot associate the abandon and naive enthusiasm of the pre-raphaelites with the technical proficiency of the later renaissance and botticelli stands not only for the spirit dominating and shining through the substance but in a way for the incompatibility of perfect idealization with perfect execution and yet this conflict troubles us we feel that the two should be wedded so that the legitimate offspring might be perfection but when perfect technique is attained as in a japanese carving the result is almost as devoid of human feeling and warmth as a machine-made product we feel this instinctive choice of irregularity wherever we turn wherever that is that we have to do with humanity or human achievement we do not it is true delight in the flaw in the diamond but elsewhere we are in perpetual conflict with nature whose sole object seems to be the obliteration of extremes and the ultimate establishment of a happy medium of uniformity we find perfection cold and lifeless in the human face i doubt if a woman has ever been loved for an absolute regularity of feature but how many like little celestine who acknowledges herself that her nose is too crooked her eyes too hazel and her mouth too large are bewilderingly charming on that very account these features go to make up an expression which if it is not perfect is certainly not to be accounted for by merely adding up the items it is a case where the whole is greater than the sum of all its parts we admire the anatomy and poise of the greek statues but they are not humanly interesting indeed they were never meant to be for they are divinities and the symbols of an inaccessible perfection still while we speak of certain faults as being adorable notably feminine weaknesses while we make the trite remark anent a man's one redeeming vice while we shrink from nature's too chaste too aloof from human temptation too uncompromising yet we must feel a pang of conscience we are not living up to our ideals is it the mere reaction from the imposition of conventional morality i think not it is a miscomprehension of the term perfection the buddhist believes in a process of spiritual evolution that tending ever toward perfection finally reaches the state of nirvana where the individual soul is merged into the infinite how can it be differentiated from the universal spirit if it has attained all the attributes of divinity and that idea seems to be the basis of our mistaken worship of perfection a nirvana where each thing being absolutely perfect loses every distinguishing mark of character but is not our christian or even the pagan ideal higher than this for even the greek gods cold and exquisite as they were had each his individuality his character his separate function our conception of heaven if it is ever formulated nowadays has this differentiation of individuality strongly accented though the most orthodox may insist that the spirits of the blessed are sanctified with perfection yet he does not hold it is a necessary dogma that they are therefore all alike and recast in a common mould he still dares believe in that infinite variety which nature has taught us persists throughout the universe this is the fundamental difference between the oriental and the occidental point of view 
we moderns stand for the supremacy of character an ineradicable distinction between human beings which evolution and growth does not diminish but develops we believe you and i that in a million eons we shall be as different one from the other as we are now that faults may be eradicated weaknesses lose their hold but that our best parts will increase in virtue not approaching some theoretical standard but always and forever nearing that standard which is set for ourselves we have grown out of our admiration for the copperplate hand in penmanship we recognize the fact now that we need not so much follow the specimens in the copy-book as to make the best of what is distinctive in our own style of writing and this is a type of what our conception of perfection perhaps should be everything should be significant of character should supplement it translate it explain it in the japanese prints you will find almost every face with the same meaningless expression every feature calm disguising every symptom of individuality it is the oriental pose the oriental ideal just mentioned it is not considered proper to express either joy or sorrow and the perfection of poise is a sublime indifference and i have a final idea that may to a more subtle student of aesthetic seem suggestive in the beautiful parabola described by the mounting and descending sky rocket the upward and downward path are not quite parallel the stick does not drop vertically although it continually approaches that direction in other words the curve constantly approaching a straight line is beautiful despite and indeed perhaps because it never quite attains that rectilinear perfection and keeps its distinctive character to the end it is beautiful in its whole progress for that path defines the curve of the parabola essay eighteen the plays the thing would you rather see a good play performed by poor actors or a poor play done by good actors asked celestine as a professor of the romantic view of life and a ghost seer there is but one answer to the question the play's the thing acting is at best a secondary art an art that is of interpretation though we as critics judge it of itself alone but to an idealist no play ever is or can be perfectly performed as we accept the conventions of stage carpentry impossible cottages flat trees property rocks misfit costumes and tinsel ornament so we must gloss over the imperfections of the players and accept their struttings and mouthings as the fantastic accessories of stage land no actor that ever lived ever acted throughout a whole drama as a sane human being would act we are used to thinking the contrary but the compression of time and space prevents verisimilitude a play is not supposed to simulate life except by an established convention every art has its medium and its limitation it is indeed a limitation that makes art possible in the drama the limitation is the use of the time element the play's the thing we may read it from the book or have it recited before the footlights but the lasting delight is the charm of plot that with the frail assistance of the actor finds its way to our emotions a good play done by poor actors then for me if i must choose between the two evils fancy creates imagination constructs the child sporting ingenuously with both these powers dwells in a world of his own either induced by his mastering fiat or remodelled nearer to his heart's desire from the rags and fragments at hand in his toy theatre alone is the perfect play produced for there imagination is stage manager and has the hosts of wonderland in his cast the child is the only perfect romanticist he has the keen fresh eye upon nature all is play and the critical faculty is not yet aroused so in a way too was all primitive drama the audience at shakespearean plays heard but noble poesies saw but a virile dream made partly visible like a ghost beckoning away their thoughts 
so even today is the chinese theatre with its hundreds of arbitrary conventions its lack of scenery and its artificial eloquence the veriest coolie knows that a painted face a white nose stripes and crosses on the cheeks does not portray a masked intention as if the actor bore a placard writ with the word villain forthwith all the rest is fairy the player does but lightly guide the rein and pegasus soars free so no play can be perfectly performed we have created an artificial standard of realism and we say that bernhardt duse and coquelin portray emotion with consummate art it has been agreed by authorities on aesthetic that simulated passion surpasses in suggestive power real emotion the actor must not lose himself in his part he must maintain the objective relation none the less however must we as audience supply imagination to extend the play from art to life from a romantic point of view such devotion to realism is unnecessary we are swayed by the wildest absurdities of melodrama alike false to life and false to art and we accept the operas of wagner with all their pasteboard dragons and bull-necked heroes belching forth technique as impressive stimuli to the imagination even through such crude means uplifted either by passionate brotherhood or upon the wings of song we are wafted far and fast the play oh the play's the thing for see if you prefer the bad play performed by the good actors why not go to life itself what else indeed is life it was the old duke in lewis carroll's sylvie and bruno who first pointed this out all the world's a stage where are performed the worst of badly constructed plays plays with neither unity nor sequence nor climax but performed with absolute perfection why waste your time cursing the adelphi when like the duke you can see the perfect art of the street the railway porter's dialect is still convincing the fat woman with her screaming children may enter at any minute with her touches of wonderful realism if you go to the theatre for acting you go to the wrong place watch the pont neuf for the despairing suicide lurk in whitechapel visit in mayfair coquette with a spaniard sweetheart or rob a jew strike an englishman love an american girl flirt with a french countess or watch a samoyan beauty at the salt pools catching fish but try not to find perfect acting behind a row of footlights but if after all the play's the thing it is as much a mistake to look for real drama upon the street there everything is incomplete and for the satisfaction of our aesthetic sense we require the threads to be brought together and the pattern developed the knots tied our contemplation of life is usually analytic we delight in discovering motives elementary passions traits of character and human nature our joy in art on the other hand arises from synthesis we love to see effect follow cause and events march logically passions work themselves out the triumph of virtue and justice life as we see it is a series of photographs the drama presents these successively as in a biograph with all the insignificant intermediary glimpses removed we hunger for the finished story the poem with the envoy for this reason we have the drama and the novel and now celestine asks me would you rather read a good story poorly written than a poor story well written the question is as fair as the other though not quite in the same case we may agree that acting is a secondary art but literature has more dignified claims to considerations here we are contemplating a wedding of two arts not the employment of one by another one might as well say then would you rather see a good man married to a bad woman or the reverse it is the critic who attempts always to divorce the two yet as in almost all marriage where the two arts work together one is usually the more important 
one may have one's preferences but the selection of that art which embodies an idea rather than the one which aims at an interpretation marks the romanticist's point of view one art must be masculine creative and the other feminine and adorning the glory of the one is strength of the other beauty for me then the manly choice give me the good story badly told the fine song poorly sung the virile design clumsily carved rather than the opposite cases the necessity of such a choice is not a mere whim of celestine's it is a problem we are forced to confront every day we must take sides it is not often even from the philistine's point of view that we have the good thing well done while the poor thing badly done we have everywhere between these limits of perfection and hopelessness then lies our everyday world of art and there continually we must make our choice if we could deal with abstractions there would be no question at all and undoubtedly we would all prefer to enjoy the discarnate ideal rather than any incomplete embodiment no matter how praiseworthy the presentment but few of us are good enough musicians to hear the music in our mind's ear when we look over the score of an opera few of us can dream whole romances like dumas without putting pen to paper few even can long remember the blended glories of a sunset we must have some tangible sign to lure back memory and imagination and if we recognize the fact that such symbols are symbols merely conventions without intrinsic value as art then we have the eyes of the child and the romantic view of life and lastly celestine leaned to me in her green kimono and said would you rather see a pretty girl in an ugly gown or an ugly girl in a pretty gown ah one does not need to hold the romantic view of life to answer that question end of essay eighteen essays nineteen and twenty of the romance of the commonplace by gillette burgess this librivox recording is in the public domain essay nineteen living alone i have lived so long alone now that it seems almost as if there were two of me one who goes out to meet friends transacts business and buys things and one who returns dons more comfortable raiment lights a pipe and dreams one the world knows the other no one knows but the flies on the wall i keep no pets since these would enforce my keeping regular hours the only familiars i have therefore are my clock my fire and my candles and how companionable these may become one does not know who does not live alone they owe me the debt of life and repay it each in its own way faithfully and apparently willingly i have a lamp too but a lamp is a dull thing especially when half filled and this one bores me i might count my typewriter also but she is too strenuous and she makes me too impatient by her inability to spell besides the clock fire and candles may with no great stretch of the imagination be readily conceived to have volition and once started they contribute not a little to relieving the tedium of living alone my clock is always the same it has no surprises it may go a bit fast or slow but it has a maddeningly accurate conscience and its fidelity in ringing the eight o'clock alarm proves it inhuman still it lives and moves beating a sober accompaniment to my thoughts altogether it is not unlike a faithful conscientious servant never obtrusive always punctual and obedient but with an unremitting devotion to orders that is at times exasperating many a man has stood in fear and shame of his valet and so i look askance furtively with a suppressed curse when the hands point to my bath my luncheon or my sortie into town it would be a relief sometimes if my clock stopped were i not sure that it would be my fault but my fire is more feminine full of moods and whims ardent domestic and inspiring 
now a fire like a woman should be something besides beautiful though in many houses the hearth is a mere accessory it should have other uses than to provide mere warmth though this is often its sole reason for being nor should it be a mere culinary necessity though i have known open fires to be kindled for that alone and treated as domestic servants in my house the fire has all these functions and more for it is my friend and has consoled many lonely moments it is a mistress full of unexpected fancies and vagaries it has too a more sacred quality for it is an altar where i burn the incense of memory and sacrifice to the gods of the future it is both human and divine a tool and symbol at once no one i think can know how much of all this a fire can be who has not himself laid lighted and kindled and coaxed it who has not utilized its services and accepted its consolations my fire is however often a jealous mistress she warms me and makes my heart glad but i dare not leave her side on a wintry day i must keep well within bounds hold her hand or be chilled i need but little urging i pull up my couch take pencil and paper and she twinkles and purrs by my side casting flickering glances at me as i work not till the flames die down and the coals glow soberly red do i find the more practical pleasures of friendship and housewifely service now my fire plays the part of cook and in her proper sphere outdoes every stove or range ever lighted a little duck laid gently across the grate the kettle whistling with steam and the coffee-pot ready what bachelor was ever attended by more charming handmaiden than i by my little open fire she will heat an iron or shaving water as gracefully too waiting upon me with a jocund willingness no servant could be so companionable still she must be humoured as one must always humour a woman try to drive her or make her feel that she is but a slave and you shall see how quickly she resents it there is a psychological moment for broiling on an open fire and postponement is fatal it takes a world of petting and poking to soothe her caprice when she is in a blazing temper but remember her sex and she melts in a glow like a mollified child kindling and lighting my fire is a ritual i cannot go about it thoughtlessly or without excitement the birth of the first curling flame inspires me for the heart becomes an altar sacred to the household gods if the day offers the least plausible pretext for a fire i light one and sit down in worship i resent a warm morning when economy struggles with desire luckily my studio is at the north of the house and no matter if the sun is warm abroad there is a cool corner waiting where a fire needs no apology the sun creeps in toward noon and puts out the flames but all the morning i enjoy the blaze in the evening the fire becomes absolutely necessary and provides both heat and light giving a new life of its own to the darkness of the room then i become a parsi put on my sacerdotal robes for such lonely priestcraft requires costume and fall into a reverie for my sacrifices old letters feed the flames they say that coal in burning gives back the stored sunlight of past ages what lost fires burn then when love letters go up in smoke to illumine for one brief last instant the shadows of memory my candles partake of the nature of both clock and fire they are to be depended upon when let alone to burn just six hours marking the time like the ticking pendulum but they give light and warmth too in their own way in gentle imitation of the fire they also have moods less petulant than the fires but they require as little attention as the clock the fire seems immortal though the coals fade into ashes the morning's resurrection seems to continue the same personality and the same flames seem to be incarnated living again the same old life but the life of a candle seems visibly limited to a definite space of time and its end is clearly to be seen 
in that aspect it seems more human and lovable than the fire a candle is more like a petted animal whose short life seems to lead to nothing beyond we may put more coals on the fire and continue its existence indefinitely but the candle is doomed putting another one in the socket does not renew a previous existence but if it is a short life it is a merry one and its service is glad and generous my little army of candles is constantly being replenished like brave and loyal soldiers they lay down their lives gallantly in my cause and new ones fill up the vacant ranks fighting the powers of darkness this is my bachelor reverie but high noon approaches and my metamorphosis is at hand now the sun has struck the fireplace with a lance of light and i that other i must rise dress and out into the world essay twenty a cartomania with something of the excitement alice felt when she crawled through the looking-glass i used to pore over my atlas geography was for me a pastime rather than a study there was one page in the book where the huge bulging expanse of the united states lay and there on the extreme left hand of the vari-coloured patchwork of states and territories was the abode of romance and adventure a long and narrow patch tinted pink curving with the pacific ocean and ribbed with the fuzzy hachures of the sierra nevada mountains this was the ultima thule of my dreams beyond which my sober-minded hopes dared not stray further on in the book i saw europe irregular with ragged peninsulas and bays asia vast and shapeless with the great blue stretch of siberia atop and the clumsy barren yellow triangle of africa but these foreign countries were to my young imagination as inaccessible as fairyland they did not properly come into the world of possibility they were as unreal as ghosts remote as the feudal ages and i put them by with a sigh as hopeless the world is a big place to the eyes of a child and all beyond his kin but names how could i know that the end of the century was even then whirling me toward wonders that even my arabian magi would not have thought possible but to-day in this far western town then but a semi-barbarous camp of gold miners i have seen an airship half completed upon the stocks and this morning in my own room i rang up celestine and talked with her over the wire a hundred miles away maps were my favorite playgrounds and so real were they that it almost seemed that with a sufficiently powerful microscope i might see the very inhabitants living their strangely costumed customs there was a black dot on my fascinating pink patch marked san francisco and now that dream come true i try to see this city with the eyes of my childhood and wonder that i am really here to get the strangeness of the chance, I have to think back and back till I see that map stretched out before the boy and follow his finger across the tiers of states that run from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Everyone who has not traveled much must feel the excitement that maps give when intently studied. No one has been everywhere, and for each some unvisited spot must charm him with its romantic possibilities but there are certain cities almost universally enticing to the imagination the world's great meeting-places where if one but waits long enough one can find anybody london cairo bombay hong kong san francisco new york these are the jewels upon the girdle that surrounds the globe to know these places is to have lived to the full limit of anglo-saxon privilege but the true cartomaniac is not content with ready-made countries he must build his own lands how many kingdoms and empires have i not drawn from the tip of my pencil now the achievement of a plausible state is not so easy as it might appear there is nothing so difficult as to create out of hand an interesting coastline try and invent an irregular shore that shall be convincing and you will see how much more cleverly nature works than you here is where accident surpasses design 
spill a puddle of colored water on a sheet of paper and pound it with your fist and lo an outline is produced which you could not excel in a day's hard work with your pencil the establishment of a boundary line too requires much thought in order that your frontier interlocks well with your neighbors your rivers must be well studied your mountains planned and your cities located according to the requirements of the game you must name your places you must calculate your distances and you must erase and correct many times before you can rival the picturesque possibilities of such a land as india for instance which from the point of view of the sentimental cartographer is one of the most interesting of states if such an effort is too difficult for the beginner one might begin with a country of which something is known yet which never has been charted gulliver's travels for instance contains information of many lands that should be drawn to scale lilliput brobdingnag laputa and the land of horses would alone make a very interesting atlas the geography of fairyland offers charming opportunities for the draughtsman for myself i prefer the magical territory of the arthurian legends and i have platted sir lancelot's isle with joyous guard at the northern end high over the sea there is a plaisance a wood a maze and a wharf jutting out into a shallow smiling water while the list occupy a promontory to the south oh the opportunities are many for the cartomaniac who has mapped utopia atlantis alice's wonderland or the countries of the fairy queen who has reconstructed the plans of troy and there are other allegorical lands too that should be mapped i have had a try myself at the modern bohemia and have taken the liberty of showing within its much maligned borders arcady and the forest of arden i have even planned millimours the city of a thousand loves and i am now attempting to draw a map of the state of literature in the year nineteen o two there are many celebrated edifices too that might be trifled with i have a friend an architect who has completed the castle of zenda and he is now occupied with circe's palace with a fine eye to the decorative effect of the pig pens think of laying out the gardens grottoes and palaces of the arabian nights why has the castle of otranto been neglected and udolpho and castle dangerous and the moated grange many novelists and i think most writers of pure romance have played this game stevenson dreaming in his father's office drew the map of treasure island and from that chart came forth hint by hint the suggestions for his masterpiece morris hewlett drew a plat of the ancient marshes and forests where the forest lovers wandered and it is a pity he did not publish it in more detail this is one of the geographical solutions of story writing a queer anomalous method whereby the symbol suggests the concept the cheaper magazines often use old cuts and request some hack to write a story to fit the illustration but the map is an abstraction its revelations are cabalistic not definite a good map is a stage set for romantic fiction ready for anybody who can write or dream the play end of essay twenty essays twenty one and twenty two of the romance of the commonplace by gillette burgess this librivox recording is in the public domain essay twenty one the science of flattery time was when people were less sophisticated and almost everybody could be flattered a compliment was the pinch of salt that could be placed upon any bird's tail but such game is scarcer now and to capture one's quarry one has to practice all the arts of modern social warfare we have for instance been taught to believe time out of mind that women are especially susceptible to this saccharine process that one had but to make a pretty speech and her conquest was assured but what lady nowadays can take a compliment without bridling it is as much as a man's reputation is worth to make a plain straightforward statement of approbation he must veil his meaning so that it can be discovered only by a roundabout reflection 
whether it be true or not he is held offensively responsible for the blush with which it is received so to be successful one must be politic and tactful one must adopt the indirect method and above all one must escape the obvious to say what has been said many times before defeats the very purpose whether it be good or evil for which we flatter the artist discards the hackneyed compliment and endeavors to place his arrow in a spot that has never been hit before he will compliment a poet upon his drawings and a painter upon his verses if a woman ordinarily plainly dressed has a single effective garment does he compliment her upon that particular costume by no means subtlety demands that he flatter her by pointing out some interesting feature in one of her common frocks without hinting that it is surprising to see her particularly well clad such compliments have the flavor of novelty and are treasured up by the recipient to be quoted long after the donor has forgotten them the tribute of unexpected praise is more grateful to a person than the reward for which he works hardest and is most confident it discovers to him new and pleasing attributes it has all the zest and relish that the particular always has more than the general and besides for the person who happens to light upon some little favorite trick of individuality and to notice and to comment upon it the reward is great such a flatterer is in the heart of the flattered one throned with the authority of discernment he is considered forever after as a critic of the first importance every one has a hobby an idiosyncrasy visible or invisible it is the art of the flatterer to discover it and his science to use it to his own ends flattery is however an edged tool and must be used with care it is not every one who has the tact to decide at a glance just how much his victim will stand he may know enough perhaps to praise the author of a successful book for some other one of his works which has not attained a popular vogue he may have the discretion to banter men about their success with the opposite sex and to accuse women of cleverness but for all that he may often misjudge his object and give embarrassment if not actual affront for all such the safest weapon is the written word this is the ambush from which your prey cannot escape if a letter of praise of compliment or even of deliberate flattery is made decently interesting if it is not too grossly cloying even for private perusal it cannot fail to count it has to be paid for by no blush no awkward moment no painful conspicuous self-consciousness no hypocritical denial it strikes an undefending victim and brings him down without a struggle such tributes of praise can be read and re-read without mortification it is a sweet-smelling incense that burns perpetually before the shrine of vanity one compliment written down in black and white is worth any number of spoken words and the trouble that has been taken to commit such praise to paper gives the offering an added interest and importance anything that can be said can be written from the eulogy of a lady's slipper to the appreciation of a solo on the harp you may be sure that any unconventionality of manner will be atoned for by the seduction of a honeyed manner stevenson in his playful decalogue for gentlemen set down as his first canon thou shalt not write an anonymous letter but it cannot be doubted that he would have accepted an unsigned note of admiration the element of time in flattery too is often disregarded few would-be flatterers understand the increased influence of a compliment deferred it is again the same case of the misuse of the obvious when your friend's book appears or his picture is displayed there are enough to compliment him on the spot but your own sympathetic endorsement delayed a few months or even iterated comes to him when he is least expecting the compliment he is off his guard and the shot goes home when i give celestine a present she thanks me immediately of course but that is not the last of it in every third letter or so i am reminded of her gratitude and my kindness there is however a flattery of manner as well as of matter 
celestine to whose wise counsels i am indebted for many a shortcut in the making of friends once laid down for me the following rules for dealing with women first be intellectual with pretty women second be frivolous with intellectual women third be serious and en procès with young girls fourth be saucy and impudent with old ladies call them by their first names if necessary it goes without saying that such audacious methods require boldness and sureness of touch especially in the application of the fourth rule but even that when attempted with spirit and assurance has given miraculous results in a case where a woman's age is in question action speaks far louder than words perhaps the most successful method of flattery is that of the person who makes the fewest compliments to gain a name for brusqueness and frankness is in a way to attain a reputation for sincerity whether this is just or not it is undoubtedly true that the occasional unlooked-for praise of such a person acquires an exaggerated importance and worth this system is similar to that of the billiard player who goes through the first half of his game wretchedly in order to surprise his opponent with the dexterity of his shots later on but it is an amateurish ruse and is soon discovered and discounted at its true value yet in a way too it is justifiable since unpleasant comments are usually accepted as candid while pleasant ones alone are suspected there is a kind of conscious vanity to which flattery comes welcomely however patent the hyperboles may appear to such persons and there are many a certain amount of adulation oils the mental machine they do not believe all that is said but prefer on the whole to be surrounded by pleasant fictions rather than by unpleasant facts they prefer harmony to honesty and though the oil on the troubled waters of life does not dispel the storm it makes easier sailing to others especially if they be creators in any art compliments stimulate and impel to their best endeavor many a man has achieved a masterpiece chiefly because a woman declared him capable of it the question of the object for which flattery is employed is here beside the mark it may be used or misused it may be true or false of itself although to be sure the word flattery has attained an evil significance and has come to stand for counterfeit approval all that has been said however applies to one as well as to the other even when praise has the least foundation in fact it may prove beneficial to the person flattered arousing a pride which creates the admired quality that was wholly lacking thus i have known a man notorious for his vulgarity stimulated to a very creditable politeness by the most undeserved and insincere compliment upon his table manners i have used the three testimonials of admiration as synonymous but celestine says that praise is a rightful fee a compliment is a tip and that flattery is bribery essay twenty two romance en route how tired i am of the question how do you like london and how do you like new york would you rather live in san francisco or paris why indeed should i not like london kalamazoo patagonia bombay or any other place where live men and women walk the streets eat drink and are merry how can i say whether el dorado is better than arcady or a square room more convenient than an oblong one every living space has its own fascination its mysteries its characteristic delights ask me rather if i can understand london if i can catch the point of view of the french concierge if i comprehend the slang and bustle of chicago like them show me the town i cannot like know them ah that is different this is the charm of travel to keep up the feeling of strangeness to the end never to take things for granted or let them grow stale to see them always as though one had never seen them before then and only then can we see things as they really are when i become cosmopolitan world old blasé when i think and speak in all languages i shall fly to some deserted island to study the last most impenetrable enigma myself
but meanwhile i can purchase romance retail at the mere cost of a railway ticket i can close my eyes in one city and wake next morning in its mental antipode romance requires only a new point of view it is the art of getting fresh glimpses of the commonplace one need not be transported to the days of chivalry one need not even travel one need only begin life anew every morning and look out upon the world unfamiliarly as the child does one must be born a discoverer thus one may keep youth for the sport never loses colour one game won or lost the next has an equal interest though we use the same counters and the same board the combinations are always fresh still though one may find this fountain of perpetual youth in one's breakfast glass the obvious conventional method is to go forth for the adventure and get this famed elixir at some foreign and well advertised spring for this purpose tourists travel taking part in a pilgrimage of whose meaning and proper method they are wholly ignorant in their boxes and portmanteaus they pack not hopes of mystery faith in the compelling marvels of the world nor the wonder of strange sights but instead fault-finding comparisons and prejudice against all manners not their own they do not see in the omnibus of london the automobile of paris the electric trolley of new york and the cable car of san francisco the pregnant evidence of several points of view on life art and commerce but they perceive only grotesque contrasts with their own particular means of locomotion they do not delight in the incomprehensible hurly-burly of civilization that has produced the city man the bounder the coster the hoodlum hooligan and sundowner nor do they attempt to solve the mystery or get the meat from such strange shells instead they see only the clerk at the lunch counter bolting his chops and half-pint the incredible waistcoat of the pretentious blageur or the buttons and moke of the ruffling d'artagnan of the old kent road so the tourist travels with his eyes shut while the true traveller has a lookout on life keen for new sensations to do things in rome as the romans do that is his motto he must eat spaghetti with his fingers his rice and chopped suey with chopsticks or he fails of their subtle relish he calls no western town crude or uncivilized but he tries to cultivate a taste for cocktails that he may imbibe the native fire of occidental enthusiasm in the east he is an oriental he changes his mind his costume and his spectacles wherever he goes and underneath the little peculiarities of custom and environment he finds the essential realities of life to taste all this fine crisp flavour of living not to write about it or fit it to sociological theories but to live it understand it be it this is the art of travel the art of romance the art of youth but there is no baedeker to guide such a sentimental tourist through such experiences as these it takes a lively glance to recognize a man disguised in a frock coat and to find him blood brother to the eskimo well there is a place in utah on the central pacific railroad called monotony the settlement consists of a station a water tank and a corrugated iron bunkhouse the level horizon swings round a full circle enclosing a flat arid waste bisected by an unfenced line of rails straight as a stretched string the population consists of a telegraph operator a foreman and six section hands yet i dare say i would like to stay there a while on the way and perhaps i would taste some charm that london never gave i am not so sure that but that before i took wing again i might not like it in some respects better even than paris End of essay twenty two Essays twenty three and twenty four of the Romance of the Commonplace by Gillette Burgess. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Essay twenty three The Edge of the World. To find the colonial or the provincial more cultured, better educated in life, and keenlier cognizant of the world's progress than the ordinary metropolitan is a common enough paradox 
class for class the outlander has more energy greater sapience and a truer zest of intellect than the citizen at the capital by the outlander is not meant however the mere suburban or rural inhabitant but the dweller at the outpost of civilization the picket on the edge of the world let us grant that in the gross every new community must be crude it takes time to grow ivy over the walls to soften the primary colors into harmonious tones to smooth off the rough edges but let us also grant that at all the back doorways of empire in faraway corners of the earth are assembled little coteries of men and women who by reason of their very isolation rather than despite it have made themselves cosmopolitan catholic eclectic and stand ever ready to welcome each in its own polite dialect and idiom the astonished traveller who thinks he has left all that is great and good behind this compensation is indeed a natural law if we cut back half the shoots of a shrub the surviving sprouts will be more vigorous the deprivation of one sense renders the others more acute make it hard for an ambitious lad to obtain an education and working alone by candlelight he will outstrip the student with greater advantages so it is with the colonial who realizes his poverty of artistic and intellectual resources he must in self-defense and to compensate for his isolation make friends with the world at large and his mental vision accustomed to long ranges of sight becomes sharp and subtle to avoid the reproach of provincialism he studies the great centres of thought and watches eagerly for the first signs of new growths in fads fashions art and politics it is for this reason that the british colonial is more british than the englishman at home plunged in the midst of the turmoil of everyday excitements the dwellers in great cities lose much of the true and fine significance of things a thousand enterprises are beginning and amidst a myriad essays the headway of yesterday's novelty is lost in the struggle of today's agonist the little temporary local success seems big with import and the slower development of more serious and permanent virtues is ignored things are seen so closely that they are out of true proportion and they are seen through media of personality that diffract and magnify but the provincial far from this complicated aspect of intellectual life gains greatly in perspective separated by great space he is in a way separated by time also and he sees what another generation will perhaps see in the history of to-day for he watches not only literary london that tiniest and most garrulous of gossiping villages but a dozen other hives of thought as well and from his very distance can the more easily discern the first signs of preeminence his ears are not ringing with the myriad petty clamours but he can hear rising above the multitudinous hum the voice of those who sing clearest the connoisseur in art views a painting from across the hall the lover of music does not sit too close to the orchestra and so the intelligent looker-on at life does not come too often in familiar touch with the aspirants for fame living as one might say upon a hill the stranger thus gets the range volume and trend of human activities and sees their movements like those of armies marching below him though they seem as ants so far away he can trace the direction of waves of emotion that follow round the earth like the tides of the sea in every community however small or remote there are a few who delight in this comprehensive view of things who keep up with the times and so far as their immediate neighbours are concerned are ahead of the prevailing mode as the meteorologist studying the reports from north south east and west can trace the progress of storm and wind so these intelligent observers can predict what will be talked about next and how soon the first murmurs will reach their shores their cosmic laboratory is the club library table with its journals and periodicals from all over the world 
the first hint of a new success in literature comes from the london weeklies and then if the british opinion is corroborated by american favor the new york papers take up the note of praise and one may follow the progress of a novel's triumph across three thousand five hundred miles of continent or see the word pass from colony to colony over the whole empire the londoner sees but the bubbles at the spring the pioneer by the pacific watches the course of a mighty stream increasing in depth and width to-morrow or in three months the vogue will reach his own town and he will smile to see all tongues wag of the latest literary success so it is with art and so it is with fashions with the drama and with every fad and foible from golf and babism to the last song and catchword of the music halls the colonial is behind the times what does it matter are we not all behind the times of to-morrow so long as we cannot travel faster than the news it makes little difference and it is wise when we are in san francisco to do as the franciscans do it is as bad to be ahead of the times as to be behind and it is best to follow the style of one's own locality with a shrewd eye to one's purchases for the future buying what we can see must come into popular favour but does your metropolitan enjoy this complexity this living in the future not he he cares nothing for the vieux for him ping-pong is dead or dying he neither knows nor cares that it still lives in the occident marching in glory ever towards the west along the old trail to fame of the last six successful books discussed over his muffins does he know which have been virile enough to survive transplanting to other shores which have immigrated and become naturalized in the colonies no he is for the next little victory at the tea-tables of the elect and yet this afterglow this subsequent invasion of new territory is what brings enduring fame before the city election is substantiated the country must be heard from the urban hears the solo voices of adulation the worship of those near and dear to celebrity but the great chorus that sweeps the hero up to parnassus comes from a wider stage the army of invasion never comes home again to be hailed as victor until it has encircled the globe but it is the greater conquest that the dweller at the outpost sees at first like a cloud no bigger than a man's hand and it is his game to watch and await it it is better so waste no pity upon him at the edge of the world for the big game needs big men and it is the boldest and most strenuous spirits who push to ultima thule the anemic and neurotic do not emigrate the reddest blood has flowed in the veins of the pioneer ever since the first migration he does things rather than talks of things others have done he knows life even if he knows not ibsen meet him in his far-away home and he holds your interest with an unlooked-for charm take him to the elgin marbles and he will have and hold his own idea of art unborrowed from textbooks he knows more of your city's history than you do yourself panic or the furor of a fashion cannot hypnotize him the importance of a celebrated name cannot embarrass him for he has met men unknown to fame who have lived as uncrowned kings he has seen cities rise from the plain he has made the wilderness to blossom like the rose he has lived not written epics and in addition to gaining all this experience that trained the pioneers of old he has while living at the confines of civilization kept in touch with the world and has tasted the exhilarating flavor of the old and new in one mouthful for in this century distance is swept away and no land is really isolate the pioneer lives like a god above distinctions of time at once in the past the present and the future essay twenty four the diary habit for seven years i have kept my diary scrupulously without missing a day and now at the beginning of a new twelvemonth i am wondering whether i should maintain or renounce it there are certain good habits it would seem as hard to break as bad ones and if the practice of keeping a daily journal is a praiseworthy one it derives no little of its virtue from sheer inertia 
the half-filled book tempts one on there is a pleasure in seeing the progress of the volume leaf by leaf like sentimental misers we hoard our store of memories we end each day with a definite statement of fact or fancy and it grows harder and harder to abstain from the self-enforced duty yet it is seldom a pleasure when one is fatigued with excitement or work to transmit our affairs to writing some it is true love it for its own sake or as a relief for pent-up emotions but in one way or another most autobiographical journalists consider the occupation as a prudent depositor regards his frugal savings in the bank some time somehow they think these coined memories will prove useful does this time ever come i wonder for me it has not come yet though i still picture a late reflective age when i shall enjoy recalling the past and live again my old sensations but life is more strenuous than of yore and even at seventy or eighty nowadays no one need consider himself too old for a fresh active interest in the world about him your old gentleman of to-day does not sit in his own corner of the fireplace and dote over the lost years he reads the morning papers and insists upon going to the theatre with his nieces on wet evenings have i then been laying up honey for a winter of discontent that shall never come besides this distrust of my diaries i am awakening after seven years to the fact that as autobiography the books are strangely lacking in interest they are not convincing i thought as i did my clerkly task that i should always be i but a cursory glance at these naive pages shows that they were written by a thousand different persons no one of whom speaks the language of the emotions as i know it to-day it is true then my diary has convinced me that we do become different persons every seven years here is written down rage hate delight affection and yearning no word of which is comprehensible to me now they leave me quite cold i am reading the adventures of someone else not my own who was it i have forgotten the dialect of my youth ah indeed the boy is father of the man i will be indulgent as a son should to paternal indiscretions and yet for the bare skeleton of my history these volumes are useful enough the pages which while still wet with ink and tears i considered lyric essays have fallen to a merely utilitarian value i am thankful on that account for them and for the fact that my bookkeeping was well systematized and indexed as outward form goes my diaries are models of manner so for those still under the old-fashioned spell who would adopt a plan of entry let me describe them the especial event of each day if the day held anything worthy of remark or remembrance was boldly noted at the top of the page over the date whirring the leaves i catch many suggestive phrases dinner at mademoiselle qui vive's it was there i first tasted champagne henry irving and macbeth but it was not the actor that made that night famous in my correspondence what an industrious scribbler s r was to be sure i had not thought we went quite so hard and k c how often she appears in the lower left and how seldom in the lower right i was a brute no doubt and small wonder she married flemingway perpendicularly along the inner margin i wrote the names of those to whom i had been introduced that day and on a back page i kept a chronological list of the same i met kitty it seems on a friday perhaps that accounts for our not hitting it off most of these are names and nothing more now and it gives my heart a leap to come across sally in that list of non-entities to think that there was ever a time when i did not know her besides all this the books are extra illustrated in the most significant manner there is hardly a page that does not contain some trifling memento here a theatre coupon pasted in or a clipping from the programme an engraved card or a pencilled note there a scrap of a photograph worn out in my pocket-book somebody's sketched profile or at rare intervals a wisp of some one's hair this reddish curl was it kitty's or from dora's brow oh i remember it was myrtle gave it me no i am wrong i stole it from nettie 
i pasted them in with eager trembling fingers but i regard them now without a tremor there are other pages being filled which interest me more occasionally i open a book eighteen ninety five perhaps and consult a date to be sure that millicent's birthday is on november twelfth or to determine just who was at kitty's coming out dinner here is a diagram of the table with the places of all the guests named so i sat beside nora did i and who was nora i have forgotten her name now she is mrs alfred fortunatus sometimes i think it would be better to write up my diary in advance to fill in the year's pages with what i would like to do and attempt to live up to the prophecy and yet i have had too many unforeseen pleasures in my life for that i would rather trust fate than imagination so chiefly because i have kept the book for seven years i shall probably keep it seven years more it gratifies my conceit to chronicle my small happenings and somehow written down in fair script they seem important and besides i am a bit anxious to see how many times a certain name which has lately begun to make itself prominent will appear at the top of the pages i promise to tell you some time if celestine is willing end of essay twenty four essays twenty five and twenty six of the romance of the commonplace by gillette burgess this LibriVox recording is in the public domain essay twenty five the perfect go-between surely the modern invention that has done most to perpetuate romance is the telephone the man that however used to this machine can take up its earpiece without a thrill of wonder has no soul the locomotive the steamship the automobile have but made travel a bit more rapid they have added no new element of mystery even the telegraph fails to give any true feeling of surprise it is no whit more wonderful than that one after writing a letter and slipping it into a red mailbox should be handed a reply by a strange blue-clad gentleman after many days a telegraphic dispatch does not even hold the handwriting of the sender it is cold colourless metallic but a machine that can bring your friend into the same room with you at a moment's notice who can deny the poetry of such a victory over space and time not until some genius invents a thought transmitter shall a more stupendous aid to romance be discovered for see it is not only one's friends that are caught in the net of telephone wires one can drag up a whole city full i have but to sit down at my desk and call up a number and he or she must reply true i cannot force any one to answer but if i have the audacity and persistency it will go hard if i do not find some one who is willing to while away a leisure inquisitive moment in inconsequent conversation it is my privilege to live in a telephone city where the habit is extraordinarily developed one out of every sixteen of the population is connected to that most amiable of go-betweens the central office i have the opportunity of investigating some thirty thousand souls at the ridiculously cheap price of five cents per soul not only every counting-house and shop doctor's office and corner grocery has its wire but every residence with any claims to acquaintance what romance gone to waste for few it seems have imagination enough to embrace such unlimited opportunities this morning sonia called me at eight twenty five apologizing for her kind-heartedness in letting me sleep when she knew i wished to work think of that for an alarm clock sonia's voice ten miles away so i am awakened by the telephone i call by telephone flirt by telephone shop market and speculate over the same wire we do not take long in utilizing the latest invention here in this hurried land the city is ravaged by telephonitis one invites friends to dinner one makes appointments one breaks the news of the death of a friend one proposes marriage all by means of this little instrument i know one lady who has her machine connected by flexible wires so that she may talk in bed she need not be too strict in regard to dress for her interviews no one ever knows i know two old men who while away long evenings together playing chess when the weather is too harsh to leave home beside each board stands the faithful receiver 
one has but to whisper k b to q three or some such rigmarole into the nickel-plated extension and he has checkmated his opponent across the bay with such common intercourse as this many are the comedies of the telephone i have myself entertained a visitor with a diversion he will not soon forget the day he came i took him to my telephone and introduced him in turn to a half-dozen ladies of my acquaintance who plied him with badinage we set forth then on a tour of calls and i enjoyed his several attempts at identifying the voices he had heard over the wire it is not always easy to recognize a voice and remember it i remember an unfortunate experience of my own with two sisters which brought a week's embarrassment for the voices of members of one family do have a marvellous similarity in the telephone and if one is anxious to call upon fanny when elizabeth is out one must be very sure just which sister one is speaking to when making an appointment the necessity for such precaution has led some of my friends to adopt telephone methods which must be extremely amusing to one who could hear both sides of the conversation in many houses the telephone is situated in the hall altogether too near the dining-room for any confidential communication if the questioner is careful he may so word his inquiries that they may be answered by a mere yes or no and papa smoking after dinner is none the wiser if the girl finds it impossible to reply in unguarded terms she has been known to say somewhat vaguely of course which conveys to the man at the other end of the wire the fact that she is not alone some too have more definite codes celestine has arranged with me that when she mentions the call it means the forenoon the chronicle stands for afternoon while by the examiner i understand that she refers to the evening if then i ring her up and say when can you go walking to-day i want to be sure not to meet that fool clubberly clubberly who is at her elbow hears her reply sweetly really uh, yes i saw it in the chronicle and how is he to know what it is all about oh he could have his revenge easily enough were he not an ass for he might be kissing celestine or in thought even as she is speaking for all i could know with this romantic battery opposed to her what chance has poor mrs grundy what hard-hearted parent can successfully immure his daughter while the copper wire strings out toward her proscribed lover here is where love laughs at locksmiths were a dozen ineligibles forbidden the house the moment mamma's back is turned and she has gone out for her round of calls little daughter takes the telephone off the hook and presto she has her room full of clandestine company does any rash young man dare ring her up while her parents are near she has but to say sweetly oh you have the wrong number and hang up it is too wonderful you may lie by telephone with a straight face or you may call a man a liar with impunity if you have no answer ready to an ardent impertinence you need only say nothing and listen he is helpless you need not speak unless you want to who made the first telephone made mischief for a thousand years to come Ring. there is celestine ringing me up now pardon me if i leave you for a moment for i think she is going to give me her answer to a very important question tremendously important for me wish me good luck i hope no one will be listening essay twenty six growing up when i asked perilla how she first came to realize that she was growing up she said well when i began of my own accord to wash my sticky fingers without waiting to be told i believe she meant it literally with no moral significance that should make a parable of the statement i hope so at least for then by that test i cannot hope to have yet attained the years of discretion little sister says that she felt growing pains but here is a figure of speech surely i suppose she means the wonder of the passage from a great wistful ignorance to a limited knowledge for the first part of the path of life is a very steep upgrade i myself can point to no one circumstance that revealed to me the vision of the great march of time that is sweeping us on towards the goal i was for long like one who looks from the window of a railway carriage too busily engaged in watching the world fly past him to realize his own motion 
neither long trousers nor razors awoke me from the child trance i saw scorned infants master me by their inches i heard rumours of love and death and duty but i was unmoved it was a part of the game of existence and it seemed natural that persons should be classified and remain in categories of old and young i was a spectator outside the merry-go-round i was to be rich of course i had the mind to dare and the will to do i should be wise too why not sometimes i should have memories i thought not knowing that i was even then living away my life and that this was an era to which i should look back and deem important all my reading too went to show that i was an amateur at living things seemed really to happen in books but not to me there men were swung in unknown furies sensations were keen and impelling and life had the sharp sting of reality my own emotions seemed insipid and inadequate for a citizen of the world surely such minor escapades and trivialities as mine were not worth considering and so when the storm and stress came i was ill prepared and at the first blow my pride went down some devil as in a dream whispered in my ear that perhaps i might not succeed after all and it came to me as a summons that the time had come to be out and doing and i saw that the conquest of my ambition would be achieved not by the impetuous onslaught that should carry all before it but by the slow and tedious siege laid with years of waiting and working and watching it was then perhaps though i did not know it that i began to grow up and became a man i opened my eyes and looked about me it was as if i had been landed fresh from the country in the busy town like the sleeper awakened no more field-faring and traipsing holidays under the blue skies i must choose my street and fight my way for it against the throng it struck me with a sense of my inferiority that there was an absolute quality of knowledge i had not mastered some of my classmates seemed to know things while i had but acquired information they could swim i dared not go in over my head they had convictions i had only opinions it was the difference between the language of frenchmen and they who learn french here i thought was the final classification and i wrote myself down a witless neophyte in the world's mysteries for my whole education had been founded upon the value of the verity of the straight line and wisdom was my highest ideal by this standard i measured myself and my experience i delighted in the beauty of science but of that other beauty which is its own excuse for being i did not know i was as one who saw form without colour or the outline without the mass i had not yet come to myself i was a child yet and the result of my immediate environment a mental chameleon a few generations of my austere ancestors impregnated my blood with their stern virtues and it still ran cold and tranquil in my veins but there were more remote and subtle influences behind me that must work themselves out and in some substratum of consciousness the pure greek in me survived and so it was diana me who brought me at last to the door of the temple and i saw with her eyes and heard with her ears and the world grew beautiful an altogether fitting setting for her charms and then i knew in very truth that i had grown up but yet by a sublime miracle i had in the same revelation recovered my youth if indeed i had ever really been young before now succeed or fail as i might life would always be fair and interesting for diana me was but one of a divine sisterhood and there were many degrees to be taken so a kind of passion seized me to know life's different phases and find the secret of the whole and that mood god willing will preserve my virginity to the end so here i am by the grace of diana me on the true road to youth again not to that absolute unconcern of all but the present that i once felt nor to the fool's paradise where mida would have it is the true happiness the ability to fool oneself but to a kind of childlike wonder at things ah little sister may you never wander from it as i did and the knowledge of what is really the most worth while and you perilla you need not pretend that you don't know for the truth flashes from your jest 
for this is the very blossom of my youth the era of knowing as that was the era of being and though there may come other dark days as there were before the bud burst into bloom i have seen the beginning and i know the law now and i trust that the fruit of my life the doing may be even more worth the while and i shall perhaps find that wisdom and beauty and goodness are but one thing as the poets say that living is a continual growing up and that age is only a youth that knows why it is happy End of Essay 26